Hello, I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm John Rabe. We the people. Those are the first three words of the greatest governing document ever devised by man, the Constitution of the United States. Our Constitution was written to secure our God-given freedoms, freedoms Americans have cherished for well over 200 years. That Constitution ultimately places the power to make the laws and policies that will govern our land in the hands of our elected representatives. But now there's a movement afoot to snatch that power away from the people, away from you, and to put it into the hands of unelected judges. And it's been largely successful. Instead of, as Abraham Lincoln called it, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, we increasingly have government of, by, and for the judges. The founders of our nation intended for powers in the federal government to be divided among three branches so that no one branch, nor the government itself, could become too powerful. But today, one branch has cast off these constitutional limitations and is now imposing its will on the other branches, and even on you and me individually. On this program, we'll expose the harmful agenda that judges and the Supreme Court have been imposing on America. We begin with the judicial attack on 2,000 years of traditional marriage. November 4, 2008, California. Seven million voters approved Proposition 8, a state constitutional amendment affirming traditional marriage. It passes by a wide margin. They did what about 30 other states have done. They amended their constitution to say marriage is going to be recognized as between a man and a woman. But by the end of the month, the California Supreme Court gives the go-ahead for three lawsuits against the constitutional amendment. August 4, 2010, federal judge Vaughn Walker of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals rules Prop 8 to be unconstitutional. Same-sex marriages then commence. Walker himself is a homosexual, yet he does not recuse himself. So many of us in California uh, were very excited to support Proposition 8. And uh, when a single judge overturned the will of the people, this was so distressing to us as Californians, but it should be distressing to all of us across this nation when uh, activist judges take within their own purview um, decisions that go against the majority, go against the will of the people. December 7, 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court agrees to hear the Prop 8 case. February 28, 2013, the Obama administration submits a brief to the Supreme Court in reference to the case in favor of same-sex marriage. June 26, 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court rules in such a way that allows for same-sex marriages in California, despite the ballot of seven million voters. So once again, we have a case of the courts coming in and completely overruling the will of the people in 31 states in this instance. And when you subvert the will of the people like that and frustrate the will of the people, you will end up with a lot of the incivility that we have in our public life today. Well, look at the example of abortion. Abortion was imposed on the American people by the will of seven men in 1973 in Roe v. Wade. They took that decision out of the hands of we the people. And so it was not decided democratically, but rather imposed on us by men with life tenure. And abortion has been contentious ever since, and it has not gone away. That's right, rather than letting the political process deal with it, they found something in the Constitution that no one had ever found for uh, roughly 200 previous years or 180 or 190 previous years, and now said, this is what the Constitution says. And they've done that numerous times since. You know, it's amazing you say that even, because even though they didn't find it for 190 years, it's still not there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. the constitutional right to terminate your pregnancy or even the constitutional right to privacy, that's not there either. It only emanates from penumbras, whatever those are. Yeah, that, that's actually what is said in one of the Supreme Court rulings is that this is an emanation, uh, emanations of penumbras, which is literally shadows coming out of clouds <laughs> of what the Constitution says. Once you've gotten to that point, what you're saying is, is it says whatever I feel like it means today. And at that point, we're no longer a constitutional republic. Yeah, then it's no longer the rule of law. It's just the rule of judges. Exactly. Look at the example with the same-sex marriage. We were just talking about that a few moments ago. In 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court said in the Bowers decision 
that there is no constitutional right to commit sodomy. But then in 2003, the court also said that there is a right to commit sodomy. So from 1986 to 2003, what changed? Obviously the Constitution didn't change, but rather the interpretation of the Constitution. And specifically what changed, uh, among other things, was Sandra Day O'Connor's opinion of what the Constitution yeah. says. She voted with the majority in 1986 saying the Constitution does not guarantee a right to sodomy. And then in 2003, she said that it did. That shows you what we're dealing with here. This has nothing to do with the text of the Constitution. This has nothing to do with the rights that our founders actually intended to protect. This has to do with literally the whims of a few unelected judges. Well, let's take a closer look at this because in order to cure the disease, it's vital that we know what caused it. Exactly how have judges taken on this power to not only interpret laws, but to make laws? Justice Story in the early 19th century said there's never been a time when Christianity did not lay at the very foundation of the common law. But what we've had in recent years are these activist judges who have convinced themselves that the Constitution is living and evolving and they can reinterpret it according to their own social preferences. The idea that the Constitution is a living document is really preposterous. What they mean by that is that a judge can change it. So we have judges who have created new rights, who have knocked out laws and practices that have been part of our heritage since the beginning. And uh, you can call the role of what they've done, uh, trying to uh, throw out traditional marriage of a man and a woman, uh, throwing out the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag because it has the words under God in it, uh, creating new rights that are not in the Constitution, like the right to abortion, the right to sodomy, the right to same-sex marriage licenses, the right to have pornography, even with taxpayers' money. You know these are not in the Constitution. And it is an offense against the American people, uh, against we the people, and against our whole form of government. And the result is that the First Amendment has been turned on its head. Judicial activism is when a court substitutes its own values, its own ideas, its own words for the values, ideas, and principles embodied in the words of the Constitution. This is a serious problem in our courts, and it comes from judges not approaching the Constitution as neutral arbiters, but looking at it as a tool to advance their policy goals. It's people who are activists first and judges second, effectively. The judges up and down the line seem to have gotten the idea that they are imbued with a special wisdom and that they can say whatever the Constitution is. It's not only the Supreme Court, it's the federal court judges up and down the line. It's also a lot of state court judges. Judges have power and authority in the first place because they take an oath uh, and they are empowered to enforce the laws and the Constitution of the United States. Now, they are regularly uh, violating that oath because they're enforcing not the Constitution, but their own views and the views of the class to which they belong and to which they cater. Yeah, what has happened is that judges pay more attention to what they have written, to their own words, than what the Constitution says and the Constitution's words. I should certainly hope that our judges are all very wise, learned individuals. That's a wonderful goal. But their job is not to be these philosopher kings who rule our nation. We do need judges, and all judges are not activist judges. Judges have a role to play. They should be like baseball umpires. You can't run a baseball game without an umpire because somebody has to call the balls and strikes and call the close plays. The umpire uh, cannot change the rules of the game. What we've had in our country for the last 50 years, and it's really all happened in our lifetime, is the judges are changing the rules of the game. They are rewriting the Constitution. They are creating new rights that are not in the Constitution because the judges think they're supreme. They can simply throw out the vote of the big majority of the people, and they've done that again and again. We need judges who will respect the words of the Constitution, not try to import their own values into it, but try to look at the text, look at the original meaning of the founders, and interpret the document on its own terms, not try to bring their policy in, and certainly not try to start 
uh, with a policy result they're looking for and finding legal ways uh, to get there. They don't, we don't want someone who's going to in invent new rights that aren't in the Constitution or ignore the rights that are already there. What's at stake in America is whether we're going to be ruled by judges or men as contrasted being governed by the rule of law, which is the government of God. That's the single most important issue that we face as a people. John, I imagine so many people are hearing this concept of a living constitution these days that they think that's what it was meant to be. That's right. Children learn it in school now. People think that's the correct answer, that we have an organic or a living constitution. I love what Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia has said about that. He's been one of the foremost exponents of judicial restraint and getting back to what the Constitution actually means. And Justice Scalia says, living Constitution, I like my Constitution dead. <laughs> it's a funny <laughs> quote, but what does he mean by that? We are blessed to be governed by a constitution, that's our highest governing authority in America from an earthly perspective. It's a document, it's words on the page. What is the blessing of that? The blessing of that is they don't change. They are what they are. The words that are on the page are the same words that were put down on paper over 200 years ago. What happens though is when the judges come and reinterpret those words to change them into whatever they want, you're taking the governing, governing authority away from the document and putting it in the hands of these people. That's exactly what a written constitution is designed to avoid. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, the Founding Fathers spent so much time working over those words and crafting those words and arguing even with each other exactly what the, what the words meant. And so therefore, they didn't expect us to have, a, as one of our guests said, another constitutional convention every time the U.S. Supreme Court meets. Exactly, it would be a waste of time to have spent all that energy hammering out those words if they didn't intend for them to stick. There is a way to amend the Constitution, there's a process for that, but it's not for judges to do. Unfortunately, even during the founding era, they began to see almost too late the damage that the judiciary could possibly do. Well, as a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson once said this, the Constitution is a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, which they may twist and shape into any form they please. Sounds like Thomas Jefferson uh, was reading today's newspaper or something. It does, and that's what happens when the words on the page no longer mean what they meant. You now have the judges simply asserting their rule. And what we have now, in addition to them reinterpreting the words of the Constitution, we have judges going elsewhere to justify their interpretations. The aforementioned Justice Antonin Scalia once famously said in a dissent that day by day, case by case, the Supreme Court is busy designing a constitution for a country I do not recognize. That's recently become literal as judges are increasingly going outside our country to other sources to justify their rulings. Let's take a closer look. One of the curious new developments on the Supreme Court is that now some of the justices have cited foreign courts or foreign opinions in the development of their own opinions about American domestic law. I think this is really an outrage because every one of them took an oath to uphold and defend the United States Constitution. Phyllis Schlafly is an attorney and the author of The Supremacists, The Tyranny of Judges and How to Stop It. This was particularly uh, evident in the case of Lawrence v. Texas, which was the Texas sodomy case, where the court created this new right of sodomy that nobody else had ever seen in the Constitution. So they couldn't find anything in our U.S. Constitution to uphold this decision. So the, the court relied on uh, the British Parliament, a European Court of Human Rights, and some brief that was filed by a U.N. High Commissioner. Now the idea that these items should decide what U.S. law is, is just an outrage. These judges, these justices on the Supreme Court are proudly saying that they in many cases are resorting to international tradition, foreign tradition, when there is utterly no authority for them to do that under the Constitution. David Limbaugh is an attorney and the author of Persecution, How Liberals Are Waging War on Christianity. You undermine the Constitution when you resort to foreign law whimsically like that. 
but it's also in substance a dangerous thing because the European left is way out on an extreme limb. European courts or Canadian courts uh, or legislatures pass these kind of laws and render the kind of decisions that are uh, suppressing religious liberties. We see in Canada that the Bible, certain portions of the Bible have been declared hate speech. The same thing has happened in certain uh, European countries. And for our judges to arbitrarily adopt these types of rulings uh, constitutes a grave danger to religious liberty in this country. And the justices are not only borrowing from European courts. In one Supreme Court death penalty case, Justice Stephen Breyer wrote a dissent citing court rulings from India, Jamaica, and even Zimbabwe. Now Zimbabwe, of course, is a bloody dictatorship by Robert Mugabe. You might as well look to the Supreme Court of Cuba, which is even, which is not as bad as Zimbabwe. The late Judge Robert Bork was a legal scholar who was nominated for the Supreme Court by President Ronald Reagan in 1987. His nomination was defeated in the Senate after a contentious partisan battle. Why anything that Zimbabwe or England or France or anybody is doing today has relevance to what the people in Philadelphia and the ratifiers back when the Constitution was adopted understood themselves to be doing back then is a mystery. It doesn't have anything to do with it. There are some appropriate ways for foreign law to be considered in an American court. For example, if we have a treaty obligation with another country, it makes perfect sense to interpret that according to this international law of how treaties are to be interpreted. Carrie Severino is chief counsel and policy director for the Judicial Crisis Network. There are, however, a lot of illegitimate ways that, that uh, international and foreign law is used in courts as well, and that is when we're using it to tell us what our own constitution means. In fact, our constitution is an American document, and our laws are passed by a democratically elected Congress. We shouldn't be importing laws from other countries. It becomes really just a fig leaf for the justices to find the result that they want and then find some country. There's got to be, you know, if there's hundreds of them, there's got to be a country somewhere that, that has a law. And we could say, well, look, we're following the law of Zimbabwe and, and, uh, and Italy and China. They all have the same law. This, this is a national, international consensus. That's not how it works. Some legal experts have noted that the reliance on foreign law is accompanied by a dim view of the American Constitution. Many justices on the Supreme Court, as well as many law professors in the United States, think the United States Constitution is outmoded. After all, it was written in the 18th century and we've evolved two centuries beyond that and the Constitution really needs to be changed. In early 2012, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked on Egyptian television how she would advise Egypt in writing a new constitution. I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a constitution in the year 2012. I might look at the Constitution of South Africa. That was a, a deliberate attempt to have a fundamental instrument of government that embraced basic human rights, had an independent judiciary. It's, it, it really is, uh, I think, a, a great uh, piece of work that was done. You would almost certainly look at the European Convention on Human Rights. It is disheartening, to say the least, to see that one of our Supreme Court justices doesn't seem to think the Constitution uh, was built on principles that other nations should emulate. The most disturbing thing about her comments to me, however, was that the way that these modern constitutions that she pointed to are organized is very different understanding of the way constitutions work. We have a system that creates a government of limited powers. On the other hand, something like the, the Constitution of South Africa starts with rights like the right to housing, the right to health care, not negative rights where you can't interfere with my freedom of religion or speech or things like that. No, these are rights where the government has to actually provide these things for you. And that's a very different understanding of how the government works. For two centuries, Americans thought of themselves as exceptional, that they were not like the people of Europe. And indeed, they weren't. The American people recognized a principle that did not prevail in these other countries. And that principle was that the civil government does not have jurisdiction over much of our lives. 
Justice Ginsburg does not believe in a constitution that defines liberty as freedom from the civil government imposing its standards upon every area of your life. And many judges are ignorant instruments of a movement that would place all of the American people into bondage rather than enjoying the liberty that our founders fought for and risked their lives, their fortunes, and their honor. Jerry, as we watch that segment, I am just again struck by the words of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a United States Supreme Court justice being interviewed on a foreign network saying those things about our Constitution. Wasn't she sworn in on the U.S. Constitution? Wasn't she sworn in to uphold the U.S. Constitution? Isn't President Obama, when he was sworn in, didn't he say, I will uphold the Constitution? All the judges are sworn in on it. How could they be so... Uh, opposed essentially to the Constitution. Yeah, and she would say, well, I'm not opposed to the Constitution, but what she makes very clear in that interview is that she thinks there are lots of modern documents that are much better than the Constitution. She's entitled to her opinion, but as a United States Supreme Court justice upholding our Constitution or charged with upholding our Constitution, I would hope that we would have justices who would actually have a high regard for the Constitution that they've been charged with upholding. I once interviewed Dr. Donald Lutz, who is an expert on the origins of the American Constitution, and he said, look, the U.S. Constitution is the basis for all these other different constitutions that went out in the world, including the ones that Ruth Bader Ginsburg were uh, you know, promoting. And so ultimately, it's the U.S. Constitution that paved the way. Now, were there some flaws in it? Yes, but the founders said there is a way to amend this Constitution. It may be difficult, it may be arduous, but they never intended judges to essentially amend the Constitution every time they meet you know, willy-nilly. And yet Ruth Bader Ginsburg's judicial philosophy tells her she can amend the Constitution every time they meet together. She's been on the most liberal wing of the court that takes the initiative in reimagining and redesigning the United States Constitution. And so you have judges now going outside the country if they can't find what they want in the Constitution and they're having trouble making up an argument for it, well, we'll just go to Zimbabwe. We'll go to some other country and find another Constitution. Judge Scalia, who we've mentioned several times, said this is like walking into a dinner party and selecting only your friends from the room. If there's enough people there, you can find whatever sort of group you want, and that's what they're doing now with world constitutions. Tragic, isn't it? Because we, the people, have to live with the consequences. So America is facing a crisis. Our freedoms are being stolen away by unelected judges who are imposing their own personal visions on our nation. So what can we do about it? Is it possible to rein in the runaway courts? The greatest virtue of a written constitution is that it is written. The constitution should be read. It's the text of the constitution that determines what the law is. This is why there's a rule of constitutional construction that every word means something and you cannot ignore any word in the constitution. The crisis is that we have a judiciary that isn't as committed as it's supposed to be to defending the Constitution and to just interpreting the Constitution and the laws for what they are. The Constitution is what it is. If you want to change it, that's what the amendment process is for. Well, I think there is something we can do about these judicial supremacists. We will not stand for judges who are legislating from the bench and remaking our culture through court order. Under Article 3 of the United States Constitution, judges do not have lifetime tenure. People think so, but they don't. Their tenure is for good behavior. The problem with the good behavior standard is that Congress has never passed a statute to enforce it. The only thing that has been used to get rid of a judge is the impeachment power. That's a very difficult uh, instrument in order to see the courts obey the law. And I don't think we should put up with it. Uh, I think the American people have got to breathe on their congressmen to say, do your duty. Fortunately, 
Article 3 of the Constitution gives Congress the power to make exceptions and regulations to what the Supreme Court hears and to decide what cases all the other federal courts can hear. And Congress has done this many times through our history. The founders of our nation gave us the greatest gift they could give us, a written constitution that provided the framework for the freest nation in history. But as you've just seen, the Constitution is under attack, and along with it, our freedoms, by unelected judges who think that they have the unusual wisdom and the intelligence to dictate to the rest of us. And how did they get there? They were appointed by politicians who should have been guarding our freedoms. This year is an election year. It's absolutely imperative that we elect people to office who respect the Constitution and are committed to appointing and confirming judges who will interpret it rather than rewriting it. The time has come for the courts to be reduced to their proper role. That's why it's never been more important for you to be informed about this issue and to make sure that your family, friends, neighbors, and church members are informed too. That's why we want to send you a special DVD which includes today's program and much more when you give a generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. On today's Kennedy Classics, you've just seen part two of We the People Under Attack. This DVD contains parts one and two, as well as special unaired bonus material. You'll want to get this program as soon as possible ahead of the 2014 elections. So, simply write to Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007, or call toll free 877 942 7677, or go online to Truth in Action. Dot org. The greatest advantage that activist judges have is the ignorance of the people. Most people don't know what the proper role of the court is and how judges are twisting the Constitution and subverting the rule of law. Our founders gave us rule of law, not rule of judges. Get your copy of this program so that you can spread the word. And as you do so, you'll be helping us to continue spreading the word as well. The DVD special, We the People Under Attack, including parts one and two, as well as special bonus material, is yours for a generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. Again, simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. Please consider a generous gift and thank you for joining us today on this special program. May God bless you. And may God bless America. Next week on Kennedy Classics. As Darwinism becomes more and more accepted in our culture, our young people are becoming both the perpetrators and the victims. That's next week. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.